Uh, G'day everyone and welcome to another edition of the Two Under podcast, the Southern Hemisphere's biggest and best Newcastle United podcast. I'm your host Keegan tonight. Joining me up in Mackay is Craig. Craig, how are you mate? I'm good mate, yourself? Very good, thank you, very good. And today we are joined by a very special guest. Uh, This guy's worked for Being Sports in America, uh, international sports website Vavil, Spain's biggest daily national sports newspaper, Marsa, American blogging network, SB Nation. He's currently doing his stuff with the zone football in America. He's graduated with a master's degree in broadcast and a big tune under welcome to Roberto Rojas. Roberto, how are you, mate? Hey, guys. How are you? It's so good to see you. It's so good to, to speak on what is an early day here in the, in the States where I'm based, but uh, I'm happy to chat about you know, it's a certain player that I think is certainly getting a lot of attention from the Newcastle fan base, but certainly as well is starting to to get some of that recognition that is finally deserved after quite some time in the Premier League. Yes, great segue. So we are here to talk about the future October Player of the Month, the future holder of October Goal of the Month, and probably current leader in the Ballon d'Or, Mr. Miguel Almiron. <laughs> <laughs> um but first of all, Roberto, we'll start with you. Uh, do you want to give us a bit of an insight and, and let the listeners know a bit about yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, you kind of did mention it in the in your intro. I've uh, I do work at the Zone right now as a social media editor, um, but obviously I've had my experience working in the journalism world for the last four or five years, maybe even more than that. Actually, uh, wait, now I'm trying to think. How long has it been? Seven years. There we go. <laughs> now I'm dating myself way back. Uh, yeah, I've been working for a lot of publications, definitely covering the sport of soccer, football, as you guys like to call it over there and in your part of the world. And, you know, certainly it's I come from Paraguay descent. So obviously the connection to there has always been part of me, has always been a case where I've always grown up loving the sport, you know, going and attending matches, obviously playing it wasn't good enough to be a professional, to be in the case of of a lot of players at Newcastle. But, you know, you know, something some things are meant to be, but I realized I needed to have something uh, connected to to that sport. And I've been able to make a career out of it, traveling to numerous countries, talking to num- numerous players, going to various games and always keeping my connections to Paraguayan football, because obviously that's where I'm from. And I always like to feel as if though it's a it's an area that not a lot of people like to talk about in comparison to the bigger countries, not just in South America, but in the world. Obviously, I'm based here in the United States as well, you know, born and raised here. Obviously, have my connection to American soccer, MLS, and and various other things uh, related to that, especially with the World Cup happening in about a few weeks. I'm certainly excited about that. A bit gutted to not see Paraguay in that. You know, it would have been really nice to see, you know, maybe more Newcastle United players on that uh, in the competition. But we might have to wait until four years from now uh, when it comes here to the States, Canada and Mexico. But other than that, yeah, it's um, it's been a crazy couple of years following Newcastle United because of a certain you know, uh, <laughs> player there. And, um, you know, I can't wait to see what this chat is all about. Yeah, for sure. Um, just, just touching on your journalist career, what do you think is the biggest story that you've covered or, or you've broken in your time as a journalist? Oh man, I mean, there's a lot. I mean, I've been fortunate enough to be a part of like various big things. I mean, I was there the night um, in the Copa America final in 2016 when Argentina lost to Chile on penalties for the second straight year. I was in that kind of area where Messi um, briefly retired from international football when he skied that penalty. <laughs> um, it was a it was a crazy scene. I didn't break it, but I was in there in the moment. Yeah, that yeah. it happened. But I think the other big one I think has to be the, the one that made uh that we're going to talk about here of a certain Miguel Miron leaving Atlanta United to, to go to Newcastle United which at the time was a, a huge thing because of the certain I guess perception of what Newcastle United was how the club was at the time the fact that they didn't spend as much money on him and they were breaking into uncharted territory going to MLS to mm. find a player like him and yeah, it's been kind of a an interesting four years of what we've been able to to see of him, but certainly in the way that we're playing, that we're talking about him now, and in, in the form that he's in, it's it's definitely paid off. And you know, you could see that in the way that Newcastle United are are playing and the kind of new 
the new project and the new, I guess, mentality that the club is having under the new ownership. Yeah. Yeah, which is great because, yeah, we're going to cover a fair bit of that. So it's good you've actually referenced it. But I guess the best place to start is the start. When when did you first see Miguel Moron? So the first time I saw him, so the club that I supported Paraguay is called Cerro Porteño. There's two big clubs historically in Paraguay. There's Cerro Porteño um, and there's Olimpia, which are the more prestigious team. They've won the most Libertadores, which is the South American equivalent of the Champions League. They've won the most local titles. And and this, you know, typically coming from a Paraguayan family, you're kind of born into that. You're kind of born into either a Cedro fan or Olympia fan. You have your your other teams out there that have smaller fan bases, but typically those two are the ones that dominate. And I fell into the Cedro bracket. And because of that, I was able to <laughs> see some of the players that played on Cedro. And one of them was Miguel Miron, who actually wasn't, it wasn't the first time I actually saw him on Cedro. It was actually... At the U20 level, uh, Paraguay were playing in the South American Youth Championship, which is basically the qualifiers for the U20 World Cup. And I recognize a, you know, he had like that bl- uh, boy band type flip- flippy hair, like something out of like One Direction or Westlife or like one of those teams. And and I, I saw him, he was, he was very skinny, he was very fast. He was playing as like an attacking midfielder and a winger. And I, I, just, see, I just saw this kid and I'm thinking how is he so fast and and the way that he looks his legs are like so skinny they look like you know sticks or something like how is it not gonna break so so i saw him and, and paraguay ended up going to the u20 world cup they finished in the round of 16 uh the last time that paraguay made it to a, a u20 world cup and then i saw him at cedro and him performing well he wasn't an immediate starter but it was good enough for him that it got him a move to lanus in argentina which is you know one of the the smaller teams in Argentina in comparison to a Boca or River or any of those other teams. And he was one of the standout players there. He, he helped this team win the, the league title back in 2016. And, you know, that it just, it just elevated him into further success. He was 22 years old at the time. And then it got him to that move to, to MLS where he played at Lenny United, where he got his, I guess his, his big break, you would say, um, being successful there, winning MLS Cup, being one of the standout players on that team um, that ended up winning, you know, that title, becoming one of the best players in MLS. And later that became his his um, his springboard to go into into Europe. Yeah. So was his sort of speed, his sort of thing that stood out as, as a youngster when you sort of first seen him? Was it like... Obviously, he's still he's still got that speed now. If anything, he's he makes the most of it. But was that probably what you thought was his biggest quality early? Yeah, I think so. I think obviously, you know, I, I never saw him as a goal scorer, and I don't think that that was never the case for him. Yes, it, obviously, time proved that. Yeah, he, he can indeed score goals. Yeah. <laughs> but just like looking at him, I just saw him as someone that was much more of a creator. And, you know, I think using that pace to, you know, break the fence, to, to open up space and to allow him to to find and, and pick passes to his forwards and his attacking players, I think that's what stood out to me. And, you know, one of the things that I thought when he first came to Atlanta was, you know, if you put him into a side that is very much offensive, and, you know, we did see that, obviously, in the amount of goals, that's where you can flourish and i think it's it's a really interesting story that i think we're going to talk about with in the and we'll get into the way that newcastle are playing right now is that you know for someone that i think was obviously highly rated and you know it, it was it's it's hard to really pick out the gems in paraguay these days especially when you know there's so much talent out there and you know i think for any country really like it's hard to really realize like yeah this is the one that's going to stand out over the rest. For Miggy, he had that potential, but certainly for my case, I never expected him to reach the potential that he's going through right now. So it came as a bit of a surprise initially, like at the time. But yeah, um, you know, it's, it's it's good to see him striving to that success. When you know, initially you thought, yeah, he's a good player. He might be good enough for like one of those like. I wouldn't say average teams, but maybe if you were to go to Europe, maybe he'll be settling into maybe a France or an Italy or like one of those like lower league teams and yeah. and just go from there. Yeah. Um, so when 
Craig, do you want to just touch on these sort of stuff in the MLS? Yeah, so when he was a young star in the MLS, uh, well, I think he was uh, 24 uh, years of age, around about 2016. How how does he cope with the, the initial uh, language barrier? Because from what we can tell on all interviews that we see with him, he still predominantly talks in Spanish. And moving from a Spanish-speaking country to uh, English-speaking country, whether it be the States or whether in the UK, is that a, a stumbling block that he has overcome and he just prefers to speak in Spanish on TV? Because I don't think I've seen him do a, a full English interview in the time he's been away from South America, you know? Yeah, it's it's very interesting to see that, considering that he played in the United States and he's been playing in English-speaking countries for the last four years, five years now, actually. <laughs> Hard to believe it. And yeah, I mean, it's it's weird, it really, isn't it? I mean, we see someone like Sergio Aguero, who was played who played in England for ten years, and you barely see any English interviews with him. Um, and you know, he's a much bigger star than Almiron is right now, and definitely has had a bigger impact. But you know, I think obviously, you know, when he came to MLS, he was playing under a Argentine manager. He's had teammates from Venezuela, Argentina. Uh, Mexico and and so on and so forth. So I think when you're used to that environment, it's, it's kind of hard to and I'm, and from speaking to people of his inner circle, yes, he knows English. He's he's I would not be surprised if he has a great understanding of it. But I think it's the case of like sometimes like these players maybe aren't comfortable enough to speak in their in that language, maybe out of fear of misinterpretation or being taken out of context or something along yeah. those lines. And I think. Now, from what I've heard, you know, he's definitely improved a lot. And I think you have to when you speak in this is like no way berating his his fluency. But I think when you are in a country for three years where, yeah, you have your you have your um, teammates that are from Spanish speaking countries. He's had that with with the likes of initially with um, Salomon Rondon, uh, Jose Perez, but even moving later with with. Portuguese speakers, which obviously is not the same language, but still very similar with the likes of Joe Ellington and Bruno Guimaraes, you know, certainly it, it becomes a bit easier, but, you know, you have other teammates that don't know those languages that <laughs> are speaking in English. Your manager speaking in English. He's giving tactics and team talks in English. So it's almost as if you have to be in that kind of mindset. And I'm sure he's understood it, but maybe it's just the case that for some players, and I don't blame them, that maybe they're just they're just not comfortable enough to speak in it out of fear of of being taken out of context or or anything like that yeah because the, the whole thing understanding yeah, tactics I... is it obviously pays off big time because he's listening to what the coaches are saying and we've seen the improvement over the last 13 14 premier league games whatever it may be and coming to not just to, not to, come to the, the uk but coming to somewhere like newcastle where there's a very strong accent as you're aware of and yeah. that, that would be an, another struggle in itself because all the international players we get, they all turn around and say, yep, I can understand a little bit of English, but the local accent, that's what I struggle with the most. <laughs> and that I can actually massively uh, get on top of because where I, where I am now, obviously here in Australia, they struggle with my accent and they speak English in this country. So uh, <laughs> someone coming from a Spanish-speaking country going to somewhere where they've got one of the most iconic accents in the UK and not being able to pick that up, the struggle I can imagine would be crazy difficult. And a lot of people will pick up the accent and the language a lot quicker. But if he is fluent in talking around with his teammates and uh, his family and everything else, then that is great to hear because we, we don't hear him speak in English. All we really hear is maybe his little after match wins when he's had a, a little uh, go on Instagram where he says, come on uh, Newcastle or come on the lads, that type of thing. But yeah, it, it's good to hear because um, I know it's something that uh, a few people have asked is how well is his English given the time he's been in English speaking countries? Yeah, no, trust me. And, and, and I've been to Newcastle already beforehand. And even for someone that is obviously fluent in English and it is English, <laughs> this is his first language. It, it did take me a while to, to understand <laughs> that accent. No offense, obviously, but yeah, it did. But, uh, it was a bit of a of a, a shock and yeah and this is something that speaks english imagine someone who's coming from an entire different culture and country going into it as well so yeah i mean again like it's, I'm, I'm i'm sure you know it, it's good to see the success that he's having and you know maybe sometimes 
he probably still has those struggles when it comes to to speaking in English and and whatnot. But you know, you would think that after so many years already in England or speak or playing in, in countries that do speak English predominantly, that he's kind of picked it up somehow. Yeah. Well, hopefully, more as long as he can understand it, and he can relay to the coaching staff anything he's not sure of, or as long as he can relay that information to the coaches and they can communicate with each other, I think perfectly fine. Um, Absolutely. So when he when he first came to Newcastle, there was a he just couldn't score. I think he had like 40, 40 odd shots before he actually he got one through. Were you worried initially when he first came? Like he, he might have sort of bit off more than you can chew and he made the wrong move. And like you said earlier, maybe he should have went to like a maybe a lower league and just to find his feet in Europe a bit more. Yeah, I think, you know, obviously when he first came in and, uh, you know, obviously the change from from Rafa Benitez to Steve Bruce wasn't exactly helpful for him because imagine having to go to a side. Or anyone. Yeah, well, yeah, that's <laughs> it. Exactly. So, you know, it's not exactly the it's not exactly the best position to be in and hindsight and time proved that. But I think, you know, I think when you're promised one thing and, you know, certainly when Miggy first came to the to England and he was going to be playing under Rafa Benitez. I'm sure he had that well in his mind that that was going to be his kind of, that was going to be the mindset and that was going to be someone that was going to lead him on at least through his first full season at Newcastle. Mind you, he came in halfway. So it was, yeah. it, was diff- it was different for, for him. But when he made that change to Steve Bruce and, you know, the whole team kind of changed and yeah, you still had players that came in like Joy Links and St. Maximin. It did feel a bit kind of weird of the way that they've been playing. And yeah, I think it, it, it did see a bit, it was a bit worrying about the way that he has been playing. And yeah, anyone that makes that jump from any league to the Premier League, you're going to have critics. You're going to have people that, you know, if you see the likes of someone like Darwin Nunez and Erling Holland, like using mm-hmm. that uh, using that reference, like Erling Holland scoring a buttload of goals right now at Man City. But someone like Nunez who came off 30 plus goals at Benfica is getting his goals at Liverpool, but you know, because of the fee as well, maybe he's not getting as much as, as we hope he would get. And so that comes with pressure. And I think with new, with Miki, it came with a lot, you know, the fact that he was the most expensive player in the club's history. I mean, obviously that was Mm. broken afterwards, but you know, the fact that he was coming from a league that typically isn't looked upon by premier league clubs, certainly not for foreign players and like someone in Miki's position. It's more the reverse where yeah, like so, European players go there to sort of finish their careers and, and stuff like that, not not the other way, like a player coming into his prime, actually going to the best league in, in Europe and and sort of trying to apply his trade there. Yeah. Yeah, so that's that's that was kind of the fear. And I think, you know, that there were some people that kind of were, again, like they were a bit fearful of saying, oh, why is he playing there? Why he should have went to, I think, I think it's like Southampton or like one of the teams in, in Premier League as well were interested, but also, you know, he could have went to like a Portugal or a, in Italy, a Spain as well. You know, that the language very yeah. much more easier, but um, I think he didn't give up. And I think I, I applaud him from not doing that. And, you know, it, then it proved into, into really what is a, a player that has talent and you see that in the way that he plays. But I think, at least in the last two, three years, it, it is really also someone that is a player that I think is also subject to division and opinion as well. Yeah. So when the last couple of years, like just, just going through that, like a lot of people would say that he's been, I don't know if it was out of form or he's not good enough. Like there was always that argument. Yeah, he works hard and no one could ever question his work rate, but it was always his his end product and he couldn't, he just couldn't sort of finish off his work and no one ever questioned his work rate. But what, why do you think he couldn't finish that work off? Was it just the fact that, like you said earlier, he wasn't that sort of scorer. He was more of the facilitator. Yeah. Yeah. I think so too. But even that was also a bit worrying considering that he, even to this day, like his, his goal rate, absolutely. Uh, outshines his, his assist rate and you know i think obviously 
now as he kind of evolved into more of a goal scorer than a creator. I think initially at the time, it kind of did feel as if though he wasn't showing up in the right times. And I think this this is still something, an issue that even is to this day, like, you know, maybe his finishing isn't properly. I think he's still a player that is massively dependent on his left foot. You know, you, you, I think to play in a, <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. This, this is not <laughs> even, well, it's not even a, an attack on him, but it's just, I think when you play no, in a league like that, fact. yeah, you, you definitely have to to be flexible and, and be able to, to be proactive in the way that you play. And, you know, you still see that again. You know the fact that he's still scoring goals is, is still proving that hey who needs a right foot <laughs> as yeah, long as my exactly. left foot is scoring <laughs> yes. goals uh that's all that matters but I, I do i did worry about that but you know certainly from what i've been hearing and from people that are close to him and, and even in the club that you know he's under heady how he's kind of improved in a way that he's able to finish his product that and he even said that as well like eddie Howe even said that like you know he didn't he didn't care about how many goals or assists that he gets. He didn't care about those numbers. He cared about, like you said, the work rate of him being able to, to pick out those passes, to be able to, you know, create space for the other players and, and to play as a team, not as an, an individual or anything like that. And so, mm-hmm. yeah, what he's been doing, I think, is, is a plus to what Eddie Howe is, is asking for of, from him. And I think that was needed i think certainly it's helped him it's helped a lot of players on that side that maybe were kind of hindered under steve bruce and i think you know as long as he's able to still demonstrate that like i said i think he still has his weaknesses and you can see that sometimes in the way that he plays but i think as long as he's able to to still be an effective player in a side that is changing mind you this is a side that is going to go through a lot of changes in the next few months or years or anything like that i think as long as he's able to show that hey i want to be a part of this i want to be a part of this new project i'm not here to be just shipped off like that just because you guys now have the resources to do so that and say that yeah i am indispensable but at least i'm here to prove my worth and i'm here to to stay and, and to help the side be successful i think that's kind of that mentality that now is is trying to to allow him to to be, that has allowed him to be successful. Yeah, and I think even like you said, his inconsistency over the last couple of years could probably be down to the fact that who was coaching him, and he probably wasn't getting the best coaching. I guess what he could be, and like look at him like now. I think even that sort of first six months when he signed, when when Rafa was coach, he did show a lot. Like I think a lot of fans seen something. Like I think this guy's going to be a good player, and then obviously. He left and another guy came in who wasn't very good and <laughs> he wasn't alone. I don't think there was many players who actually improved under the previous manager, but now he's being coached again. He, even his defensive work, he's actually using his pace defensively to really close down and he's one of the leaders of their sort of front press we do and, and really um, put put defenders under pressure with his pace to close down quickly and yeah, I think yeah, he's always I think he's always had that sort of ability, but he just he just needed guidance and sort of proper coaching to really maximize what he's got and I think that's what he's sort of had the last 12 months. He's he's had a proper coach and he's actually really starting to flourish now with coaching and guidance and obviously he's got his confidence now, which is probably the biggest thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I agree. I think that, you know, and, and certainly, you know, this isn't to, to the disregard Steve Bruce, who even even said that, you know, he, he was very happy with having someone like Miggy on his team, that if he could, he would he would have 11 of them. But even then, it, it, it did feel as if, though, the team wasn't improving in the way that it should have. And it certainly affected Miggy. It affected a lot of players as well. And so I think when you make that big switch, even from – the second part of that season, last season, of course, you, you saw something, you know, he scored that wonder goal against Crystal Palace and, and the way that he's been playing certainly improved. And I, I think it's just that, you know, this isn't to be as blunt as I want to be, but I think that's, that was it. I think it was just yeah. having to make that switch from a more pragmatic manager rather than someone that is very much defensive and, and not being able to, to utilize a, a lot of offense when needed. I think that was just something that that Newcastle needed and certainly something that Miggy needed in order to for him to 
to propel himself into the player that, at least right now, is is playing in the way that he should be. Yeah, oh, we'll we'll sort of we'll start with this season, Craig. You got something there for Roberto? Yeah, so this season he, he started off on fire during preseason. Uh, six goals and two assists, I think. And there was, there was a lot of talk before preseason and possibly during that Newcastle were looking at getting a, a right winger, uh, bringing somebody in who's maybe a bit more prolific or a bit more consistent within uh, that attacking space. But Miggy, he, he just seemed to take that information that was maybe out in the press, whether we were genuinely after playing that position or not, I don't know. He's took the information and he's harnessed it. He's bottled it up and he's used it to light the fire in him, which Eddie has obviously uh, given the, the tools to do so as well. But that fire has just ignited and it's just got bigger and bigger and bigger. And nobody is more happy than us Newcastle fans and saying a Miggy armor on with that big beaming smile on his face because we know he's playing well. That smile is infectious. And when Miggy's happy, he's playing well and Newcastle are playing well and we're winning games. But the start of the season, I don't think anybody could have predicted it. Uh, first of all, there was the slight altercation with um, Jack Grealish. I don't know if that helped uh, light the fire in his belly that little bit more as well. But obviously, we've seen his reaction, final whistle for the Man City game, where that fan had the, the placard saying, um, Miggy, can Jack Grealish have your shirt? And he then handed that fan the shirt. Although that was that was fantastic. That was uh, a bit two fingers up to Jack Grealish on that one. But did you anticipate the start of the season that Miggy's had and how do you see him progressing from this now? Is he potentially at his peak? Is his peak even higher? Or would you say he's gone beyond that? Yeah, I mean, well, first of all, and I think we do have to, to start in order. Yeah, there, there were rumours of him wanting to leave, um, you know, I think the likes of Everton, I think Napoli were interested in, in a Pimley as well. But I think from what I heard that, yes, while Newcastle were indeed searching for a right winger, that is a bit more prolific, that was able to be a bit more, I would say, proactive in the way that they play. I think Miggy used that from as motivation. And yeah, even the Jack Grealer stuff, which I think <laughs> I, I think certainly, you know, he, he said that, oh, he shrugged it off. And Callum Wilson, I think, said it yesterday in some interview that when he was asked about it, it's like he probably just shrugged it off when he first started. But certainly, I think anyone that's in that kind of position who wouldn't want to be motivated to prove everyone wrong. And so, yeah, yeah you see that in, in the way that he's been playing. And and even, I think, in the preseason, like, yeah, he, he did get those goals. And I think that was that was very promising. And I think that showed that, okay, I think there is something that he could do. There is something that maybe next this season could come about. I didn't anticipate this either, that he would go out and score seven go six goals and or at the time now seven goals this season and leave the be in the in the top top goal scorer race and and scoring six in one month I, I never anticipated that so i think yeah we'll have to wait and see this is the weird thing about someone like him that you know when you're on form and i think that even happened when he when he first scored for newcastle i think he he went on and scored a couple goals as well in a few games as well yeah. not like this obviously but it's interesting to see if this purple patch, which which um, will end, I, I think it will. I think there will come a time where he will go scoreless in a few games. But I think as long as he's been able to be like just important in the way that he plays and and just be able to be as effective and and certainly like I mentioned beforehand, have an important part to to play on this side. I think I think it, sh it should matter. I think he should be someone that you know certainly is still has a lot to improve. He's only 28, you know, so he's not certainly someone that is very much old. I think he's right in the peak of his powers. He's demonstrating it. He's, he's proving it uh, now week in week that he can indeed score. He has the potential and he could do it. I, it's going to be interesting to see if he keeps it up. My guess is that he will. I, I don't, I can't give you a number in terms of how many goals he might finish in the season, but I think, you know, certainly what he's got seven now, his, his previous, like his highest rate, in, in English football ever was eight goals in a season. He's, he's, he's got one game to, to he's got one goal to, to break that. And he's got to play <laughs> what, at least 25 more what? games at least. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. I mean, he's definitely going to break it. So I think he hits double figures. I, I, I would, I would be absolutely confident that he should break double figures. If he can get a couple assists as well, I think that would also be something that I would be very much happy about. And 
look, as long as Newcastle, and I think a lot of fans would agree that if they can get into a European spot, even the Conference League, even if, if someone were to say, I would mm. sign off on the on the Conference League right now, I think that would be a very successful season for not just for the club, but for him as well. Agreed, mm. absolutely. This is uh, also the quality of the goals because we no one expected them to score these seven goals already this season. But has the quality of the goals taken you back as well? Because it's absolutely got us astounded the quality of these goals the volley against Fulham, the finish against Everton, and the one just uh, last week when he uh, killed it around the keeper against Villa. But for me, the, the best one was which shows a level of confidence was the goal against Spurs where he took a pass long lane. When previously, maybe Miggy last season, he probably would have tried to square that rather than take the uh, defender on and put a pass to keeper. Is this something you've seen in his lockup before? Because obviously we've seen the goal against Palace last season and everyone thought that was maybe a bit of a, a fluke, a, a one-off. But this just shows it isn't. Is this something he has done previously that you're aware of? Yeah, I mean, I, I have, I mean, you know, he does take a lot of set pieces and he has been able to score some goals outside of the box. But, you know, I think you're right. I think, yeah, exclude the word, word yeah, the, the great goals against, like, in, in terms of finesse against Fulham and Villa from outside the box. I think the Tottenham one, I think, has been my favorite because the fact that he's able to go at pace and, and of course, against the quality of opponent as well. This isn't to disregard the likes of Fulham and, hey, he scored against City as well. Okay, yeah, that he used his... He used his leg on that one, but I think it's, uh, it's hey, you take any goal that you want. But I think the goal against Tottenham was demonstrated that, okay, he can do it against the big teams. And, you know, the fact that he could beat those players one-on-one, -on -one, use his pace and to slot it right past that goalkeeper, I think it shows that, you know, he, he's got something in him that I certainly hasn't, haven't seen in, in quite some time. Definitely not in the way that he's been playing. I think, it's a it's a testament to say that yeah he can do this he can indeed become someone that could square off a pass but also someone that could you know be in the box to finish be able to score from outside the box be able to beat players one on one and that's what you want from from your attacking players to have that level of confidence and i think that's something that you know hopefully that right before the the break for the world cup where i think they have what two more games before they they restart mm -hmm. again in, in late december I think if he's able to prove it against what is it Southampton, I think Chelsea, the last two opponents, I think if he's able to show that kind of confidence again, then you get him all rested. And you could see what he's like. Like You know the demand that you, uh, Premier League players have, not just because they're playing in such a, a tight schedule and also playing for the national team, because of the fact that Paraguay haven't qualified for the World Cup. You know, he gets that month break. And I think that and Newcastle are doing some like preseason, not preseason, like they're doing like some like some camp. Yeah, 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 in Saudi Arabia, something like that. So you get them all 100%. And then you're going to be like, and I'm just wondering, like, wow, if he can do that in the way that he's playing now, what's going to be the case when he's 100%, like, absolutely, yeah. like, a bit more fresh? That's my big question. And that's going to be interesting to see what kind of form he's in. If, I mean, it's good to see in the form that he's right now. But I think give him a bit more rest, allow him to be a bit more fresh in a way and not having yeah. the demands, then you might see a much better player. Yeah, even like a just month to like recharge, just to charge up your batteries a little bit more and then come December, I think, when we restart again, he's going to be back at 100%. And, yeah, like who knows what he could be if he's going to be sort of he's got another level to go to. That's frightening, not just for us, but that's frightening for everyone who he plays against as well. Absolutely. Um, just want to touch on quickly, Darren Eels. Do you think sort of him coming to the club has sort of made him uh, like comfortable, I guess, and sort of made him feel a bit more bedded into the club? Yeah, I mean, I think, yeah. I mean, certainly when you have that importance of a, someone like him that has um, – has been kind of influential in, in, in Atlanta's, you know, in Atlanta United's success and certainly in Mickey's success. I think having someone that I think was so useful and, and I think is, is certainly someone that cares about his players. And I think being part of that, I think it definitely has helped Mickey because it allowed him to be with the familiar face that I think 
shows that there is that level of confidence and there is that level of trust. I think it's good to see that. I don't know if it's the big deciding factor per se, but I think, you know, his his impact is obviously going to be something that I think is important for someone like Miki because of the way that he's he's had him at, at um at Atlanta United. So yeah, I think it's it's a big thing. I wouldn't say it's the the deciding thing, but I think certainly it's it's good to have someone that you that you definitely know and you have your your history with in a good way, obviously, and and utilize that to to kind of fuel you in a way to to become much better a, a much better player that you can. Yeah, it's more it's more you've got someone in a in a high position, I guess, who's got your back and he's in your corner. And I think, look, yeah, given the uncertainty, I suppose, with the transfer window and was his position going to be one they were going to look to replace? Like, I think the sort of internally he knows he's got someone who he trusts and who trusts him back and he has a really good relationship in a, in a high position, sort of give him the confidence that he will be looked after and, and the club aren't just going to ship him off. So, yeah, I think it sort of does have probably a bigger part to play. Not not so much now because he's, he's sort of in the, in the zone, I guess, but... So I think it's initially at the start of the season where things were a bit uncertain. I think, I think it gave him just the confidence to not worry about the position because he, he's got that guy in his corner. Yeah, no, no, I agree. I think that's that's something that I think is very much useful, and I think it allows him to to become more motivated to to help his team and to to understand that hey, I got your back. We're here to we work together. We became successful together. At, in the United States, and now let's try and do the same thing in England. Yeah. Um, so have you have you had much sort of contact or interaction with him since he he signed with Newcastle? And and if you have, what what has he sort of said about the place? I mean, I haven't spoken to him directly as much as I should, but you know, speaking to his inner circle, I think they've all have been very much at least now. I mean, you know. The fact that he he has he has his wife he has his kid you know they're definitely he's always been a personality that you know is not someone that is you know typical of maybe a an english um not english i say a premier league footballer that maybe is a bit more flashy a bit more outspoken um certainly is is good in the nightlife and i think he's someone that is very much a professional and he's always been that way he's always been someone that's very much low-key you know he doesn't go out as much and this is someone that um hearing from his inner circle that he's always someone that likes to basically just stay at home and and fuck and and watch yeah. um um what's it called just movies or play video games with his with his friends or his family members i think that's that's kind of is it boring i don't know but hey that's that's kind of the mindset he that he has to have not yeah. just because it's the way that he plays but it kind of helps him because it's like it allows him to just focus on what he wants to do and that's football. And, you know, it's not someone that's going out to, to nightclubs or causing dramas or being in the papers or anything like that. I think his overall personality has always been someone that's very much down to earth and, you know, certainly someone that is definitely settled into the city now for four years, uh, or going to be four years um, primarily well. And, you know, certainly someone that I think is very much respected, you know, for all the critics that he might have had in his career, I think at the, at the end of the day, I think he he enjoys the fact that he's very much, you know, to himself, not being too much into the into the mindset of you know someone that's always getting bombarded or or whatnot. And I think he enjoys that, and it kind of helps him just keep in a in a chill environment, a relaxed environment that allows mm-hmm. him to to not be as as stressed when it comes to these type of things that happen to Premier League players. Yeah, I think maybe that English sort of thing has helped him in a way where he doesn't get that sort of bombarded with interviews and stuff like that because his English isn't great or even if it it is okay, he still doesn't feel confident speaking to media where, like you said, his words could be sort of misinterpreted and he doesn't say what his brain is trying to tell him to say with with the translations and stuff like that. So, yeah, it's probably got a a good... uh, part to do with it i reckon um just a couple more what what could you tell us that not many people would know about miggy <laughs> in a good way or a bad way 
<laughs> you could take it whatever way you like. <laughs> uh, oh my god! Well, I don't want him to. I don't want anyone to hear as bad as it. Uh, <laughs> god, right, put me on the pressure. Um, no, I mean, I think, like I said, I think he's he's someone that. I mean, to put it lightly, he he is someone that is just very much down to earth. I think he, he is a he is a nice person. Like honestly, he is a very much respectful person. I think when you have the pressures of being kind of the the main star for your entire country and kind of being the flag bearer you think that, that that pressure would get to him. And he isn't like that at all. I mean, he's definitely someone that he's very much, um, <laughs> I, I've, I've interacted with his family members a couple of times. And he's always been someone that w- we say in the stereotypical way that he's a nerd because he kind of likes his his video games and he likes to to listen to his um, to his heavy metal. He's a metalhead, I guess, as well. That's another thing nice. that maybe a lot of people don't. There you go. That's he, perfect. He's a, he's a big <laughs> yeah. metalhead. He loves his video Did not games. Have- did not pick him as a metalhead at no, all. No, no, he's a big one, <laughs> very big, very big metalhead, very big into rock. Um, certainly, someone that you know likes his video games and surprisingly likes a lot of horror films as well. I've, I've recognized that sometimes, like he's a big horror <laughs> film fanatic, and so for someone that is just so positive so happy you see it. yeah yeah, yeah. Like, like, he looks lucky. so happy and outgoing and maybe that's just something that he's hiding into but no deep down yeah he's, he's kind of it's a bit of a dark side you know but... yeah <laughs> well, he's been terrorizing yeah, he looks, people uh, on the pitch this season so you know maybe yeah. he is watching a lot of those <laughs> there you go there you go yeah wow that did not pick that at all that is no. that oh, is uh, shaking question me. for uh, yourself roberto now you've been to uh, newcastle yourself uh, did you get to see a game? And if so, what did you think of St. James's Park and the area itself? Oh, my God. Um, yeah, so I went back in 2019. I actually went to, I remember the day as well, April 20th, 2019, Easter weekend. It was the game against Southampton, ironically enough. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the game in St. James's Park, it was a beautiful day. I, I, reckon, I remember how people were saying, oh, bundle up get ready for the weather, all that <laughs> yeah. kind of thing. But it was sunny literally the entire – I was there for three, four, four days. I was there for four days. It was sunny all throughout my time there. And Newcastle were playing uh, Southampton, and Mickey, he was playing, and he actually got injured. That was actually his last game before he got uh, – he was out for the rest of the season. But was it was a eight? game – the game hamstring? that Jose Paris scored a hat trick. Yes, the hamstring. Uh, yes. Yeah. It was that it was there. So for for a first ever Premier League game, first ever Newcastle game, to see someone <laughs> score a hat trick, um, yeah, out of the most unlikely names in Iose Paris, I think he's, yeah. he's still the last player. Is he still the last player to score a hat trick for Newcastle? If I'm not mistaken, I think you might. You're right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, Callum Wilson I, got close at the weekend, but yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Miggy obviously has gotten close as <laughs> he's, well. He's had a couple of braces, but, Yeah, but hey, if, if I'm gonna go back to a Newcastle game, I think you, you better place your bets on a hat trick. Because apparently, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not just because Newcastle haven't lost. I, I could take that. I could take that right now. Newcastle have yes. not lost a single game I've attended to. So if I ever go mm. back, which I will, put your money on a hat trick and a win. But uh, yeah. no, it was a it was a really nice place. Honestly, I, I definitely I went there when I was um I was twenty one at the time. So it certainly allowed me um to enjoy kind of the nightlife and the people were so nice and yeah, I, I really had a wonderful time there. And I've been back to England since. Uh, I've been back to Newcastle, but I've I've always been back to England and I've. I've enjoyed it honestly. It's it's such a such a nice place, and you know it's different in in comparison to America, where you kind of you get bored after a while. You want something new, and yeah, I just definitely had a really interesting time over there. And I'd love to to go back to St James's Park, especially the way that they've been playing now. I'd love to to go back and mm. and see that place bounce because I've never heard a a louder atmosphere than Newcastle at St James's Park when. When that final whistle came and everyone was so happy, it was it was such a, a wonderful environment. That's superb. Yeah, yeah, it's a beautiful thing. And on with you, Roberto. I've been to I've been lucky enough to go to two games and I've had two wins, so no hat tricks. <laughs> but but I'm we gotta go together well. then. We gotta go together. Yeah, then, yeah. To <laughs> <get that. laughs> it could be a, a mega game. Uh, Craig, go. have you got have you got anything else you want to ask, Roberto? Uh, yeah. Um, we normally do this every weekend when there's a, a Premier League game coming along. Uh, just your predictions for the Southampton, please, Roberto, for the, for the Southampton game. Yeah, it's, well, it's an interesting one because I think, you know, certainly the way that Newcastle have been playing, they've only lost one game one season this season. So, I, you know, you would think that and, and the way that Southampton's been playing, you know, right there, right into the um, into the relegation race. And, you know, I think 
certainly for them, they definitely want to get maximum points to, to escape that route. But I think the way that Newcastle have been playing, it would be very hard pressed to not back them. I think, you know, certainly we'll have to wait and see if Miggy gets onto the score sheet. I've been, <laughs> there's a, I know he's been doing so well on fantasy uh, Premier League as well. And there's a, there's a little story to that. I don't know if it's related to the way that he's been playing, but just kind of my superstitious thing that I haven't put him on my team ever since and you know i've always put him on on the side side and he every time i've had him on he's not performed well and the times i've had taken him off he's done well like literally all the season i'm just like yeah i'm far behind in my in my race in my uh leagues but (laughs) fuck it if if it's if it's the case of miggy performing well so be it i'll I'll take him out every every time but uh i'm happy to take my l i I think newcastle do get this win against southampton as a, a good prediction and why not? Another goal for Miggy. I don't know if it's going to be a goal or a brace, whatever, but why not? Get him on the score sheet as well. Exactly. Yeah, fantastic. I'm the same. I I didn't get him because I'm like, oh, no, I'm, I don't want to try and jump on the bandwagon and, and curse him now, so I'm happy to keep taking L's if it means he keeps scoring. So, I'm, yeah, <laughs> I'm in the same boat as you. But, um, yeah, that, that pretty much uh, wraps us up today. Um, just for anyone listening as well on YouTube, uh, give us a like and a comment or something if you're listening to on your podcast provider. Uh, five-star ratings never go astray for us as well, so don't be scared to uh, do that. And as well, I forgot to mention earlier, we've just opened up our uh, YouTube membership, uh, which is $1.49 a month in Australia or 85 pence a month in the UK, and it gives you a few perks on YouTube. And uh, stay tuned in the next couple of weeks. We're going to be launching some more stuff that members will obviously get priority access to and and sort of get discounts and and get looked after as well so if you'd love to we'd love to have you on board with us and yeah this has been a blast so yeah if you want to jump on now's the time to jump on uh roberto i can't thank you enough for your time tonight or this morning for you um really appreciate you jumping on and and giving us some of your time about miggy and um yeah you got anything else you want to plug and, and stuff like that before you leave no, again, thank you so much for, for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, just I guess the, the simple plugs would be like follow me on Twitter at Roberto Rojas97. You can also follow my two podcasts uh, called Low Limit Football. Uh, it's a weekly podcast that we've been doing for the last six years, just speaking about football from all over the world. We're actually going to have our World Cup previews coming up uh, with the World Cup coming soon. So be sure to tune for that. Uh, tune in for that. And of course, check out Guarani Vision, the first ever podcast dedicated to Paraguayan football in English. So if you definitely want more of a, a Miggy-centric take, but also just in general about Paraguayan <laughs> football, uh, be sure to, to follow us at Guarani Vision as well. Awesome, mate. Uh, yeah, like I said, can't thank you enough again for your time and, yes. and jumping on and and stuff like that. Um, Craig, have a good night no, to mate, you, mate. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, most appreciated. And hopefully this uh, run of form for Miggy continues long into uh, the new yeah. year and beyond. <laughs> and he lifts our Ballon d'Or next year and the Puskas yeah. award. Imagine getting <laughs> two of those in one year. There that we go. Why not? That's what he deserves it. Yeah, <laughs> he's on exactly. track. All right. Uh, yeah. Thanks very much, boys. And uh, appreciate it. And uh, we'll see you all soon. Thanks, Rob. Bye. Thanks, Rob. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Oh!